my friends and my new friends, if you're here for the first time, thank you for joining us. I have a dream. That's one small step for man. I am the greatest. You want something? Go get it. Period. Antonio, I appreciate you uh, coming on. Actually, similar name as me. Uh, Tony, I'm actually Anthony the third. So we got a commonality already, but thank you for taking the time to dive deep. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Of course. So first thing I wanted to start off with just to lay the foundation is give everyone and pretend I didn't even know you. I didn't know research on you, what your current focus is, because I know you're in real estate, you're in the crypto markets, you have a big investment portfolio. So can you explain what your current focus is, what you're doing, and uh, we'll go from there. Yes, um, I don't, I'm not really in real estate anymore in the sense that I left it two years ago. Uh, and uh, I am mostly um, concentrated on two area. And one area is equity. And uh, when I mean equity, I mean uh, American and international equity. Before, like a few years ago, I was mostly uh, overweight in American equity. Then when American equity got expensive, uh, you know, I moved to European equity as well. Uh, I do have some Asian equity. And uh, the other part of the portfolio is uh, uh, mostly on, on crypto and mostly on some main project in crypto. I do have also an allocation on, um, as a venture capitalist in um, pre-seed and seed. Um, and I am LP in some uh, famous VC uh, funds. So, and so, you know, it's a very broad, um, sort of like diversification somehow. Um, and that's what uh, we are now. Yeah. yeah. Do you mind if I ask what the uh, VCs that your LPs in, um, what those focuses for those firms are? And if you could, yeah. for the viewers, just explain what an LP is. Yeah. LP is uh, basically, basically is uh, when you become the investor in, um, in a venture fund, you have uh, like LP, which are the, the, the limited the, the partners, and then you have the general manager, which is basically uh, usually the, the people that run the VC, right? So the ones that manage the funds of, uh, of you as investors. So, I mean, you have, you know, multiple investors that they, 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 they call the LP, they put money uh, into the, the, the company, the, the company is a VC fund, and the general manager will decide how to allocate those funds. Right, there is different kind of VC funds. I mean, usually historically there were equity funds, and um, I mean, VC equity in equity means that they were buying a, a company, uh, you know, like um, seed, pre-seed, Series A on equity. Right now, the the, the ones on um, on the crypto space that they do also do equity sometimes because you have some crypto project which has also equity, but most of them usually are by, they do what is called soft agreement. Soft agreement is an agreement that you do with the owner or with the founder and with the foundation of the project, uh, you know, and uh, so that he sell you in the future, uh, the, the token that, that the project is going to release, right? There's different kinds of stages that you can, uh, you can have two and different kind of uh, VC have different kind of strategy. Some VC might focus on a particular field. I don't know the metaverse, for example. Some VC may be more broad. Some VC might limit. You know, there's you know a lot of kind of different kind of investment focus for different VC. But usually, uh, you know, the most uh, the, the 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 most uh, famous one, let's see, the ones that had a lot of success were the one that entered in pre-seed or seed stage because it's when the project is very early. Nobody knows about the project is a, a guess on a pitch deck and uh, reliability on a, on a team. But you know, if it works, you make 50, 100, 200 per, 500 per, and obviously that's a lot of money. Uh, obviously when you invest in VC, I mean, you don't take the token right away. Usually those tokens are vested and uh, the type of vesting depends from the tokenomics of the project. Every, every project uh, from the agreement between the foundation, I mean, the, the founders and the VC, obviously the VC will, you know, uh, put some conditions to make sure that the team is, uh, is, is in for the long term and create value, okay? Uh, and uh, so usually they release those, uh, uh, those uh, token uh, as the project goes, goes on with time. And uh, the time is decided by the, the condition, the term sheets that they, they agree. Exactly, so yeah, the, the interest you have in a company and the money you put forth, it appreciates if the company appreciates. So you're buying into them 
Um, but I was going to really ask for, I always find this question interesting and I like hearing answers from notable VCs or people that are just extremely good at what they do in the investing field. But what do you look for in a startup to make it eye catching? Like what, what turns the key for you to say, I'm going to put money into this company because I believe in it. All right. You know, it's very good questions. And I think, uh, uh, you know, it, it's it, everybody, every VC probably would answer that there's only one thing that you really need to look at extremely deeply is the team and how motivated is the founder. How, you know, like, and that sometimes is more important than try to understand the project because mostly you don't have any project, especially in pre-seed or even seed. You know, you have a pitch deck. I mean, a pitch deck is basically a PowerPoint presentation with the promise to deliver something. Sometimes most of them don't even have any type of beta, uh, beta uh, project. So there's no even a website or there's no even uh, a rudimental type of, um, uh, you know, product to even look at, right? So uh, it's the ability to identify the, how uh, the, the drive of the founder, how reliable it can be, and, uh, uh, you know, um, what kind of team there is, what kind of track record they have. Uh, and it's, a, it's more like a, a on a human uh, ability than on the project itself. Now, of course, I mean, uh, you need to know the space and understand uh, what is the valuable proposition of the project, what kind of mood the project can have, why would they be appealing, what kind of problem that particular project can solve uh, versus others. And uh, they, they, they need to understand, but there is the issue that usually uh, when some, some companies uh, work on a project, there's already other hundreds that are already anticipating the kind of uh, same problem that is in the industry, right? So uh, among those hundred, 90 will fail or 95 will fail, right? And so, so the, the, the choosing, picking the right team is probably one of the best things you, uh, you can do. Now, there's also another thing that you need to consider, and there's the difference between between being an investor, a value investor, or maybe we see that there is a statistical components that you need to consider. So you need to understand that, um, you know, you give for granted that this money can go to zero, right? So you try to understand what is the reward, right? And if the reward is very high, statistically, you know, understand that even if some of those will, will fail, uh, as long as some others will go extremely high uh, because of the value propositions of the, the team behind, et cetera, then you'll be okay. So you also try to understand uh, not too much the risk because the risk is always the maximum. Risk. You always assume that you're going to lose the money in VC, but you know, what kind of reward? So what is the time, you know, the target addressable market of the, 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 the project they are, you know, what kind of area they working on and why would they be able to, to grow, you know, um, a lot. Uh, that, that, that's what you look at. Yeah. And, and that's something we'll touch on in, in a little bit about diversification because that can hedge against some risk, especially VC being extremely risky sometimes. But you brought up value investing, and uh, I want to touch on that because you went to a school by one of the greatest that one of the greatest value investors went to, and that being Warren Buffett. Um, I have here that you studied uh, blockchain strategy program at Oxford University, then masters in digital currency at Nicosia University, but. Then you went to Columbia University and studied at the business school. You studied value investing. So how did you, you were so bullish on crypto in the beginning. How did you balance the vacillating crypto market with this value investing side, right? Because Warren Buffett just bought into some crypto recently, which is a huge oh, thing. Amazing. I, I actually was not aware of it. I mean, uh, you know, usually uh, you, you would find probably very, very, very little um, people that are value investors and invest in crypto, right? Munger said that crypto is a venereal uh, disease. <laughs> now, recently, in an interview, I think at uh, uh, one of the companies that he ran the portfolio for, the day, uh, you know, and uh, I mean, uh, uh, Munger is, uh, of course, uh, a Buffett uh, partner. And uh, I mean, uh, you know, like, I, I wasn't really, really bullish from the beginning, to be honest with you. I started start studying crypto in 2016, then I went uh, at the University of Nicosia, um, at around 17, 18, uh, and um, start to study. And then I start slowly, slowly to uh, buy into Bitcoin. To be honest, I never was extremely bullish on Bitcoin, never. Uh, it was okay, I understood the, you know, as a, as a VC, you understood the allocation in a portfolio of something that can, can do extremely well. 
So sometimes even an exposure of 5% can make a huge difference as it did. You know, if you have 5% of your portfolio in Bitcoin, Bitcoin does 20 pair, your portfolio goes, you know, really good. So you understand that sometimes, uh, you know, the risk reward that is, is the odds uh, in favor the reward is very high, even if the you know the odds might not be the best. So you know it makes sense to 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 go for it. But then I understood the power of ether. I understood the disruption of ether versus Bitcoin and the value position of ether, you know, compared to Bitcoin. Yeah, that is. Uh, and you know all the, the DeFi uh, activity, the, the ability, the ability for Ether to to be able to create uh, so many DApps on it, you know the the, the smart contract uh, proposition. Uh, then the, I saw the way Vitaly was acting. Vitaly was being I really like Vitaly. I think Vitaly is going to be one of the most important, uh, famous uh, people in the world in the next generation. I think he's going to be remembered with one of the greatest uh, gr greatest mind, right? Uh, and uh, and that really and then I became really bullish on on, on Ether and I always. I always was uh, overweight Ether versus Bitcoin. I mean, Bitcoin, for example, now I don't really own many Bitcoins. I, I do believe that eventually can go up, but the stage it is now, uh, it, the risk reward, it does not make sense. I mean, uh, I can probably make 100% uh, or 50% buying a very good stock in the next few years and, uh, you know, and uh, risking much less in terms of volatility, but also in terms of uh, uh, real risk, you know. Ether is a different story. Now, of course, Ether can software the same kind of, uh, let's call it disease, the disruption that that maybe a uh, Bitcoin software with with Ether, which means that that could be other uh, blockchain that can actually uh, be better, which they are. They can grow much faster, and they can eventually gain market share, and they can probably put pressure on on, on Ether. But you know what? What you understand as a value investor, uh, for example, you understand how to invest in company that has a moot, especially the Columbia University is very different from the old. Uh, I mean, Graman was the professor there, but then, you know, they moved to a different kind of uh, uh, value investing. Before there was the, remember the Graman net net, you know, the, the, the ability to look through the asset, understanding a company with low P, uh, you know, price to book and price earnings. This kind of value invest, invest, investment does not work anymore, right? So you need to look as a Munger did with something different. And the, the new, the ability to understand, you know, how to identify a better company with the moot and pay for the moot. They would they call it franchisee. And that is a bit the same will happen in crypto. If you understand, if you can have network effect, like, you know, the one that Ether has, but then you understand that, you know, on, uh, on software, uh, there is not really uh, a moat, right? The barrier rent is very low. You can go and do a copy a code and make it much better, right? Now, the difference is, you know, the community, the ability of the community to, 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 to stay around one particular, the leader, the leadership, exactly. you know, and, and the proposition of, uh, of uh, 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 you know, uh, the, the technology versus another one. And, and, and so that's what you analyze. And so that's why there's four or five projects which are really interesting and uh, could do really well. But I think you learn, even if the things are totally different, because, you know, like value investing, you, you invest in equity. You want to be sure that equity, uh, it's worth something. You, you, talk, you think about sustainable earnings. And you have the, the ability to understand that a share, at least you know, most of the times, gives you rights, right? In, in, in crypto, you don't have a share that gives you rights. So you need to understand the token economics. You need to understand the dynamics more at macro level in the sense that what is the demand and supply of the token? What's gonna drive it? So you need to think more in a different way, right? Uh, and, um, and, but you still can apply the understanding of a moot or a particular advantage Best to another, and understanding that if a company does not have a moat, and probably if a project does not have a moat, you know, it will probably uh, fail. Uh, you know, and, and and that's what happened with tokens that don't have a particular uh, network effect, or maybe the value position is easy to. There's no barrier of entry. It's easy to it's easy to re redo that project and to regain that kind of uh, that kind of uh, network effect. So in that sense, there's some similar, similarity. Yeah. If yeah, if I can add uh, just to bring even more context. The moat is like a, a way of saying like a niche, like it's it's value proposition, right? If I'm yeah, yeah. it's a bit like a barrier to entry. Like you you do something that other cannot uh, copy easily, uh, and the competition cannot catch up with you. Because what happened is, uh, and that's what value investing is. You don't pay for company without uh, a moat. See, we made a lot of money shorting company with not a moat during the 2020. Okay, because you know, make a sample of Peloton, right? 
everybody, Peladon, everybody was saying that Peladon had the mood, but, and there was some sort of network effect and, and, uh, and uh, probably community things, but, you know, it's very easy, right? For a company, you need to think like big times to uh, re, uh, redo something like a bike, make it cheaper, you know, it's very hard to, uh, to gain economy scale, such a big sale like worldwide, right? So it was quite easy to understand that all the money that Peladon was spending in growth were, uh, you know, were getting to destroy. Why are they getting to destroy? When a company has a very, a very good business with a high margin, you know, you attract competitions. Competition kicks in, right? So if you don't have a way or something that keeps competition away or you don't have an advantage that, that does not make competition uh, gain the, you know, the target um, share market against you, then basically, you know, all the money wasted to invest in growth, it's going to be destroyed. So the only way is to invest in company that has a, a national monopoly somehow. And think about Amazon, you know, is, I, mean, I mean, Amazon, of course, has competitions, but it's very hard to replace something like that because of the, the ability, you know, the logistics around it, you know, the ability to, to, uh, to get in front of you, the best product and all this. Or think about Apple. Apple, of course, has competitions, but he has kept them all. I mean, Apple is Apple. I mean, everybody is very hard. The switching costs, somebody to throw Apple away to buy Xiaomi or any other thing is very hard, right? So there's a custom captivity. So that's what you look for. And, and that's, I think that concept can be applied for the, for the crypto uh, market as well. Like mm -hmm. understanding why a project cannot be, can be better than another. Why blockchain can run better than another. Why a particular tool can, uh, you know, could do something that others cannot do or would be hard to, to, to redo. It's very hard. It's very hard because on the software, software level, it's very easy, right, to copy. You can copy and paste a, 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 um, from hit up a code, have a team, put money into it, and, and probably improve it. So it's very, very hard. So it's very dangerous, right? But if you gain that, then you can make a lot of money very easily. Yeah, that, that's amazing to see how the principles of one type of investing can be applied even to Web3, crypto, right? Because I have- Yeah, yeah. I have even, if they, even if they totally different, like, I mean, as I said, a value investor probably say, wow, crypto, I will not even touch them, right? But some kind of principles are, 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 are similar. Um, and, and then, you know, you know to, to also answer, to add something about your questions, that what, why understood, okay, what I understood by studying uh, value investing I understood the weakness of value investing, right? Because value, value investing has been really weak in the last, I mean, now it probably is catching up again, but in 2020, 2021, and all the previous 10 years, it's been really, uh, you know, downperforming versus tech and others, right? And mm -hmm. so I learned uh, something at school uh, from um, Clayton Christensen, which was a professor at the University of Howard, and he wrote a book called The Innovation Dilemma, right? And uh, he talks about S curve, mm -hmm. we talk about uh, the disruptions, and that's what I learned. And what you learn that is you learn that uh, uh, to cut it short, you learn that, you know, the great managers, I mean, the, you have a dilemma, right? Like if you're a great manager, you need to give, you need to be efficient, right? To run a, a company efficient, you need to try to give money back to shareholders, right? That's the, 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 the final work of a great CEO is, uh, uh, you know, is uh, give money back to shareholders, right? But to do that, you need to ignore or maybe leave uh, on site some niche market. And those niche market eventually will catch up and disrupt your business, right? And so those companies, those visionaries, those companies that are able to, to um, invest in this kind of a niche market and then expand and become successful because they develop a technology, it takes time, are very inefficient. They burn a lot of cash because all the money they burn is in the research development. So it takes a lot of money, time to develop a, te a technology. I think value investors are not... In interested in that, but they're going to miss out the big things, right? I mean, think about the Google, think about Apple, think about the Amazon, uh, you know, those companies, they they were burning a lot of cash for many, many years. They were really, really, uh, you know, just uh, value destroyed, right? But they were creating a technology underneath that then was able to, 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 to create a move, right? So I think that, um, uh, you know, there is like, you know, so there is understanding that if you are a good value manager and you'd run a company efficiently, you always run it at, uh, uh, at the expenses of the future of the company. So as a value investor, you know, eventually, if you don't buy a company in the motor, you buy a company well run, you're going to buy, you're gonna, you, you might end up in what they call value trap, company that have been disrupted and they will not be able to have a future. So you need to be really careful. That's why the low price earnings, the low price book does not make sense. And, and, and when you buy the tech company, you you know, you, you, 
actually taking a bet on something that nobody knows is going to happen, right? So, I mean, uh, I guess you need to be do a bit of both because, of course, a value investor will tell you, listen, I don't, I, nobody could predict, predict the, the success of Microsoft, of Google, of Amazon. We don't care. We know that we missed out, but we, you know, there was a bet that was too hard to guess, right? So that's their philosophy. And I think it makes sense, uh, especially if you have a lot of big sum to allocate. But I think uh, sometimes you need to maybe allocate some small bet, uh, the portfolio that can actually be exponential. You know, if you understand that the technology can actually be successful. Right. Yeah, that's, I mean, for people listening uh, who hear this recording back, because it'll be on all podcasting platforms, YouTube, everything, wherever you're listening. I hope you're receiving this information because I'm learning new things. Because, uh, you know, growing up, I loved reading investment books and learning about investors and all this and you know, being a part of startups. But everything you're saying is bringing new knowledge and it's connecting a dot for me to where, you know, I have a friend building an NFT marketplace, but for him, you know, the, the coder is going to take the back end and mostly copy it from whether it be an open sea or foundation. And, but the one thing they're thinking is they might want to use Polygon instead of Ethereum because a Polygon is more efficient when it comes to um, environmental impact. Uh, sure. So things like that, like that's a little niche in of itself. But I had a point for you, Antonio, you, you had four, um, four, I guess you could say, not tokens or uh, blockchain, blockchains similar in the crypto market that you were, you were big bets on. And this was as of this year. So I want to get your current take on that as of, you know, maybe a couple of months later. So you said Ethereum, Solana, yeah, I mean, Bitcoin, and Avalanche. Uh, Ethereum, Solana, uh, Avalanche, and I, I would I would think, you know, uh, either uh, Luna, because I think it's really, really good, uh, mm -hmm. uh, or Near, which actually is coming up. Actually, it's quite cheap now as well, I think. Uh, and uh, the reason is technology is really good, and uh, the, the founder is really pushing it, and the community around it is really growing. Uh, so I, I would not really put Bitcoin, sorry. Uh, Bitcoin is something that... Um, as I said, I, if you need to have a proxy for uh, the success of, um, uh, um, you know, the, like an index, let's call it, uh, you know, like the cuckoo pool for the tech, for example, I would actually think Ether would um, uh, always outperform Bitcoin, you know? Uh, so, I mean, like, uh, so, and I'm not, I don't know if the risk is high or not. I mean, I should look at the sharp ratio of both and things, but I should look at the standard deviation. But, you know, I, I think that uh, if, this crypto will go on. I think that even if uh, 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 Ether will be disrupted, we'll always outperform Bitcoin. Might be wrong, but I think uh, Ether has a lot more potential than, than, than Bitcoin. If thing goes south, because you never know, uh, I think you lose money in both anyway. So I'll rather have uh, Ether than Bitcoin. And then of course, Avax Solana, um, a Luna or Near, that would, that would be the other bet. And Avax is really interesting. Got it, got it. That's good to know. And for people listening. So for the thing that I heard you say before, I want to touch on again, and it kind of relates to many themes that we're talking about. It's this thing of the community and people buying into something to grow something, whether it be a startup or these blockchains. Um, the beauty I see of Web3, even though I'm very nascent in my knowledge of things, I have to learn more. And this conversation helps other conversations, my own research. But... The thing I like about Web3 is this decentralized aspect of it. And kind of, if you build a blockchain, it's like a DAO, where it's like a decentralized autonomous organization where it grows only by the people that buy into it instead of just a boss or a couple people contributing right. to it and then customers buying that product or service to grow it. Because customers are essentially your initial investors. So with what you're saying, that's what I'm realizing more and more is this, this thing of community um, the Reddits, right? The Twitters, like everyone, but for a blockchain itself, um, buying into that. And the Discord, I mean, as well. Yeah, of course. Discord. I mean, uh, yeah. You know, it's a sort of like a crowd uh, winsome that gets all together to create something that is the best for all of us, right? And so it'll be also the best for all the people that will join. So it's amazing. And also you feel part of something where you are partially owner. It's like uh, being uh, building uh, your your own Tesla with your own team, with your own people, you know, and being partially owner of that company. It's amazing. It's a totally different concept. So 
you don't have more like a manager corporation working, but you are part of uh, that. So I think it's extreme, very strong, you know, from a commitment point of view, the ability, even think about the moat now. Think, uh, I mean, how, how cap- what kind of captivity, something like that can have, like you, you own some, your own company, your own DAO, your own friends, one of the people you hang up with in the metaverse, you know, how could you leave them, right? You know what I mean? Like, that's amazing. How can somebody come and, and take it away from me? It's really, really interesting. It's a really strong concept and very democratic as well, because, you know, you partially, uh, that's what Web2 actually did at the beginning. It, it allowed the engagement, right, with, uh, with the clients a bit more than it was before. The review, you know, the, 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 the company type to talk to you. Now you are actually going to be the company yourself. So it's like, a, it's like an evolution of the way. Right, the, the, right. Yeah, more ownership. Exactly. Right. Good explanation. That, yeah. Yeah. So the one thing that we have to keep in mind um, is I'm referencing it here because I want to make sure it's exact with it. But we got to keep in mind, like there's still the government and economy at play, right? So what do you think of the current, because you have a good understanding of banks and, and things like that in the current economy, macro and micro economics. Where do you see this year, if any, the effect on the Fed and the rates with cryptocurrencies and, and the market and not to just stock market, but more so the crypto market? And how that will, you know, I, I think that uh, uh, that the liquidity factor is something in common, right? And uh, when it comes to liquidity, there is a lot of um, correlation between the tech, uh, for example, and uh, and this being, you know, with the crypto. So I think if, uh, uh, I mean, no, if they definitely, of course, raise, you know, the the the, the rates. I mean, obviously, we some people will think now they're already. In the price has already built the four uh, uh, hikes, or maybe five hikes. Uh, JP Morgan was coming like I think at, uh, nine at the end of 2020 or something. So everybody's putting number there, but nobody really knows how many hikes are going to be. If they do, if they would do it, they would be billionaire. But all of us would be billionaire uh, if we can guess, uh, you know, interest rate. Uh, but what I think is that, of course, uh, the pain of uh, the stock market due to uh, the inflation and the, the the hikes of the rate, uh, the rate for from the Fed will also be transferred to the crypto market. So I, I don't think uh, that crypto can go much higher and uh, it's going to leave equity behind. I think it's a, there's a common uh, denominator, which is the liquidity. And I think that will be. So I think there will be a lot of pain uh, for the next one or two years in the, in the crypto market. But it's good for VC. It's good. You buy cheap. You know, there was a period that was impossible to even by you know do project or anything like that. I mean a few months ago there were developers for on, so on Rust for Solana project asking uh, four hundred thousand dollars a year. I mean uh, everybody was just throwing money at everything. Every JPEG would just go crazy and worth uh, millions of dollars like like nothing. I mean there was too much exuberance, right? So that was not really good for the for the market. So I guess those period will uh, distinguish the people that are from the long term, the one that understand you know project versus others uh, compared to the the speculators are the ones that don't understand anything. You just buy because things it's gonna go up. That doesn't mean anything. Right. Yeah. I'm. I'm glad you said that. That's the quote by Warren Buffett, and I can't get it verbatim, but he basically says, "You can tell who's naked when the shore runs dry." Right. Yeah. Exactly. If everything falls down, you'll see the, the the real ones and who's lying or telling the truth. Um, yeah. But one thing, and, and that's down to to conviction. Sorry, you know what I mean, like because you know, like you cannot. That's why it's important understanding the fundamental and understanding the value of a project. Because otherwise, when things go down, you, you're tempted to sell. You don't know why you bought in the first place. You don't believe in something, right? Uh, you know, things go, go south, you sell, and that's why you lose money. Probably that thing's going to go up again, right? Uh, but if you understand the fundamental, you understand why you bought in the first place, you understand when to, to keep and eventually when to sell when things, when story changed. I mean, I always was very bullish on Facebook. Story changed, I had to sell. You know, but I knew why I had it. So I wasn't, you know, regretting selling. Yeah, yeah. It's the betting on the jockey and not just the horse because the jockey will lead it. Right. Um, Yeah, exactly. So one little pivot I wanted to make is I found your story so fascinating because you were early on um, in your career, 
you could say you were interested in becoming a commercial pilot and you went into studying engineering and all this stuff. How has, if any, learning those things in that field transferred over to what you're doing now? Any lessons you've taken away that can, that can be brought with you, maybe your systematic thinking or principle-based mind, like what, do you, what can you say on that point? That's an interesting question, thank you. I mean, I studied uh, as a pilot when I was younger, I came in the States and then uh, September 11th, uh, Happen if you remember, and and because of that, uh, you know, there were no a lot of lines were in distress, and it was very hard to as a foreigner get a job in, in state. So I had to go back and study another career in in um, in England. Uh, I mean, I, I probably was lucky to do that because I would have just been a pilot, and, uh, and now obviously I feel you know more. Uh, I feel this. Uh, I feel now this field more more exciting. Uh, uh, I think that what I learned. Pilot, you know, I learned one thing that it's uh, maybe stupid, but I think I, I, I start, I want to be a pilot and, and I became a pilot, a commercial pilot, uh, multi um, engine, uh, you know, commercial pilot, because I thought it was very difficult. Because in my, in my thinking when I was young, I thought I saw the, this cockpit and I thought, wow, that's, you know, you, miss, you must be smart to, to fly, right? And then when I went to do it, that was very easy. I mean, like, you know, like to, between me and you, pilots are not that smart. Like they can appear outside. They are like, of course, disciplined that they have to have a level of, certain level of attention when they do things. But to be honest, is so what I learned is that don't be scared of learning new things and thinking that you cannot do it because, you know, honestly, things from outside seems very uh, difficult. But then when you actually do it and, and put effort into it, you can achieve. So maybe it's not something that cannot, it seems a bit big or maybe a bit like loose, but I did learn that, that anything you want to learn, you can do it. And you know, crypto at the beginning in 2016, 15, 16, seemed very difficult, especially, you know, like learning uh, how Bitcoin worked and not having maybe experience in coding and things. So probably uh, I said, hey, I mean, also also piloting was very difficult at the beginning, or, or, or seemed very difficult, then you can do it. So that thing in that sense. Yeah. That that's an that's an amazing takeaway. Wow. Yeah, just the ability to show up and realize it's not as hard as it seems. All right, just go you right. know, action into it and see and adapt from there. Because we all have a learning mindset if we're if we take things on as so. That's a that's a great great takeaway. I like that. Wow. So looking forward, you know, God willing, and, and the things you're going to build. What are you looking forward to with uh, real capital ventures and, and what you have going on with that? You know, I uh, now I'm concentrating more like, you know, I really, I've not been working with um, in all my investment, real estate investment, things like that. So I'm mostly concentrating on uh, on uh, a new venture that we did uh, a couple of years ago, which is like an equity um, analysis company. And, uh, you know, I have a team of analysts. We are like three, four of us. Uh, and, uh, you know, we study equity stories and uh, now we're concentrating on small uh, micro cap that can uh, have, uh, can be very, let me call it uncorrelated from the market, because I think market is going to be really tough and uh, it's, uh, it's amazing to be able to buy a business that don't care about, uh, you know, um, inflation, any kind of macro uh, story, because you just understand the small cap that is a small business that can do well or bad regardless of the general market. I think it's quite interesting. And uh, so now we're concentrating on that. I mean, we not necessarily uh, monetize the company. We use it to manage the portfolio that we have. And, uh, uh, you know, and uh, also we like to brainstorm and, you know, it's really like a good uh, uh, learning curve. And, uh, and it really, again, it helps me, the equity. I think that equity analyst has uh, a better understanding of the potential value or the potential risk that a crypto project can have. I think that kind of mindset really, really, really helps. I don't think a coder or somebody that even would, or a trader in the crypto space can understand things that uh, a CFA or an analyst in equity understand also when it comes to crypto, because uh, uh, the, fr the kind of frame, mind frame really, really helps. I mean, uh, some of my uh, 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 early, um, employees are working for me where my team uh, now they're very famous they work for big uh, VC funds mm. and they have uh, you know they have actually uh, YouTube uh, channels they you know the, they um, invite all those big uh, 
uh, owner of those uh, blockchain. And, and uh, they, they, they work with me. I inspire them to become, uh, uh, to, to, to marry the crypto, sorry, you know, field. Uh, but they were analysts, right? And I think, and that's why they've been successful quite easy. They were like equity analysts, they understood equity, understood, you know, valuation and things like that. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Got it. So you have, like, it's kind of a mastermind of great analysts with you now. Yeah, we, you know, i tell you why, right? Uh, you know, like, it's very expensive to have uh, analysts. Analysts can make a lot of money uh, in big firms as a small firm that, you know, you don't monetize your research. Uh, you're not really, and uh, CFA is not really attracted to uh, work with you. He wants to work in, uh, you know, in the big banks, Goldman and whatever. So, but uh, I think that with us, they learn a lot. You know, they, they, they learn from the beginning, they learn how to, the value investor principle, they learn how to look at equity, they learn how to, you know, how to pick the winners in any kind of market. Uh, you know, there's things on the big banks that you cannot do. You cannot just go and, and analyze $100 million market cap company. It does not make any sense. You know, it cannot be bought by, by the big guys or by big funds. Uh, but those for a smaller portfolio, like the ones we have, can, can become really tre a treasury because, you know, they, uh, you can find values. You can, now the market is extremely efficient, right? It's very hard to find a listed company which is worth uh, $500 billion, uh, uh, you know, the really good value. I mean, you can find it, but most likely, you know, the, the, the fair value is the price because the market is extremely efficient. If you want to really outperform the market, the only way to do that is to pick up those stories that are really small. People does not know about it. They're not covered by any analyst and they hit them somewhere, you know? And, uh, and I think it's really fascinating that. And also you, by knowing the story really well, uh, you probably can talk to management. You can, uh, uh, you know, it's very easy to analyze at 200 or 300 or, even for hundred million dollars companies, not like complex, like anything like Amazon or Google or anything like that. Uh, you can know it really well and be confident to stay or not in the in this story. Uh, it's eventually illiquid. Uh, so you don't have to be worried too much about, you know, you just stay because you, you, you become partially owner of the business, which is a bit the concept of, uh, of uh, value investing. You're buying a business, not buying stock, right? And I think uh, at our dimension, we can really, uh, that's the only edge that uh, our sm small investors have, right? I mean, be able to, to, to buy the stocks versus, you know, because, you know, obviously the, what, the amount of information, the asymmetric uh, way of information those big banks and those big teams have versus, you know, versus us is really, really high, right? So the only way is to, to outperform market is to pick those kind of stories, to have that kind of investing style. Right. I appreciate you explaining all that. Yeah. So if you have anything else, I want to give a little space for you to just say anything top of mind, you know, current realizations you're going through, things you're learning at the start of the year, because I ask the questions, but I like to leave a little room for you to just uh, riff on something if you feel called to. So if there's anything you would, you would like to cap this uh, discussion off with, you can. If not, we can, uh, we can close it off. Up to you. Um... Well, I mean, we'd be speaking, I mean, we'd be moving from equity to crypto and to mm -hmm. NFT and uh, to, you know. So, uh, well, you know, what, what can I say? I say one thing that I can say that uh, probably I can leave with is um, as an investor, uh, always try to keep uh, an open mind. These things that uh, mm -hmm. uh, don't make any sense at the beginning to you. Uh, and they, you, sometimes you are pulled of, you know, all the money that people throw into something, right? Uh, you don't understand it, but you know, you don't have to necessarily invest into this, but keep always open mind, try to understand, you know, what's behind, because let's look about NFT, right? I mean, uh, a value investor or somebody that has an equity, like mine thing, it's, does not approach NFT that easily, you know what I mean? So, uh, but behind that, there is a big world, there is an evolution of things, and there is so much that honestly, by not having an open mind, you know, you can really miss out uh, one of the biggest opportunity of, of a lifetime. That is, might be the case of NFT or might be the case of any other tech or any other uh, crypto project or any other thing. So what I say is that uh, always be humble. Uh, uh, don't assume you, you know everything and keep an open mind. Uh, analyze things, try to understand them. If you don't understand them, don't invest it. 
but put an effort into it because uh, they can change your, your, your life. If I would not, if I would have kept uh, an, a close mind on, uh, on crypto, I would have missed a lot, right? And uh, as a value investor, uh, as I said, it's not easy to approach, uh, you know, the crypto world. Uh, and, and so just keep an open mind. That, that's a really good way to end off and something you're, you're living by, by everything you talk about and everything you release. Um, on your website, all the things you write and all that you're doing. So thank you for the insight. Um, like I Appreciate said, I mean, there's a lot to extract because you have a lot of knowledge, but thank you so much for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, of course.